Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this webinar organized by Doxity in partnership with St. John's University. My name is Carolina, nice to meet you all, and I'll be your host for today's event on behalf of Doxity. I see here that the first people are already starting to join in. We are going to wait a few minutes before starting to allow everyone to connect. In the meantime, feel free to say hi on our chat here in Zoom and please tell us where you are from since we are very curious. First of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us and thank our panelists for being here with us today. I want to introduce you all to Paul Walker, professor at the Maurice R. Greenberg School of Risk Management, Insurance and Actuarial Science, and Amber Steiger, Director of Graduate Admission. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having us. Together with them, we are going to discover how a comprehensive approach to identifying, assessing, prioritizing, and managing risk across the, an entire organization is the foundation of a strong company. You'll also have the possibility to interact with our speakers and ask them questions. And talking about that, I'd like to remind you that after the presentation, we will have a Q&A session where you'll be able to ask direct questions to the panelists. So don't be shy and just type all of your questions in the Q&A section here on Zoom, and we'll go through them at the end of the webinar. Also, for those of you interested in receiving your certificate of attendance by Doxity for this free masterclass, stay tuned because we will post the link to get the certificate at the end of the session. So I think that we are able to start now. Welcome to those who just joined us. And without further ado, I'm now leaving the floor to Amber and Paul for their presentation. So enjoy and see you later. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Paul Walker. I'm a professor at St. John's University and I'm glad that you've joined us today. And with me today is my wonderful colleague, Amber. I'll let Amber introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. I'm Amber Steiger. I'm the Director of Graduate Admission at St. John's University, and I am also a proud alumni of Dr. Walker's program, the MS in Enterprise Risk Management. Excellent. So uh, uh, so we're going to get started. I don't know if you, when you wake up in the morning and look at the news, but especially lately, the world seems kind of crazy, right? So I'm going to pull my slides up, but it, it, even the news this morning, the world seems crazy. And Amber, I'm just checking. Can you see the full slides now? Yes. Can. Can. All right. Excellent. So, so um, a, a weird fact. I've never verified this, but I've heard it many times. In New York City, where Amber and I are based, and uh, St. John's University is uh, is located, we actually have more risk professionals than we do police officers. Now, Amber's husband is a police officer, so that's kind of interesting, probably to her. But just to give you a sense of what we're talking about today, the subject of risk and managing risk is really an incredibly important one in today's nonprofit world, business world, e even in managing a, uh, a U.S. government or some other government. And so we have these degrees in the Greenberg School of Risk Management. And I'm specifically going to talk about uh, uh, the Master's in Enterprise Risk Management and the MBA in Enterprise Risk Management. And really a subset within those degrees, I talk about strategic risk. And so what I'm going to argue today is, yes, the world is crazy. It certainly seems crazy right now. But I think it's always been a little crazy in the sense that we've always had uncertainty in the world. And you can see this data right in front of you from my colleagues over at Cambridge, that really there's been uncertainty in the left-hand side in the U.S. stock markets for a long time. And on the right-hand side in the British stock markets, for a long time. So just kind of glance at the numbers and then down at the bottom on the lower left-hand side and also on the lower right-hand side, it basically says that there are swings of 10% greater in the stock market peak to trough, according to Cambridge. Uh, on average, that happens every 16 years. 20% uh, swings in the stock market peak to trough on average every 21 years. And so what, what, what the data is kind of telling us is, look, that as far as running an organization and operating in the world today, there's a lot of uncertainty and we have to learn to get better at dealing with that uncertainty. And, and, and uh, I saw this publication a couple of years ago and it's so telling. Additionally, today we've gone through the industrial age, we've gone through the information age, 
And today, we're really not that far into the internet and cell phones and business platforms and where the world is going to go. So we're living in a digital age today that some people would say is even revolutionary. And so you say, I would say we've always had uncertainty, but we've got this digital age today that is dramatically changing things and is giving people the ability to not only disrupt others, but to create a lot of uncertainty for the entire market. And here's how it shows up in the news. Even old products like Coca-Cola, you can see this on the top left-hand side, their new CEO a few years ago says, we've got to come up with new products. We've got to do something besides just sell Coca-Cola. Not that it's not a great product, but it's not a high growth product. It's not as good as it used to be. There's a lot of competition. People are drinking things besides soft drinks nowadays. So they have a lot of competition. And on the bottom left, I love this one because Bill Ford of Ford Motor Car said, we can't simply sell more cars. And even they were feeling the disruption and the uncertainty and trying to find ways to make more revenue and create more business models from the car or the mobility industry. And I'm sure a lot of us are Netflix fans that are watching today some great shows on Netflix. Even Netflix was caught up in all this pressure of uncertainty and risk and having to defend their strategy. And in the middle, we saw a, a, a retailer saying, I, I didn't get how tech was going to change everything. And then the one on the right really is the warning shot to companies where here in Manhattan, we have a section called Wall Street. You've probably heard of you used to have an apartment very near there. And Wall Street is telling these companies, wake up. You've got to disrupt yourself. You've got to understand all this uncertainty and this disruption. So, so we come out of historic uncertainty. We, we saw it through the stock market numbers. We're in this digital age. It's pressuring people. And then we get this as if it wasn't uncertain enough. And I'm so grateful that we're on the other side of this because that was very difficult to go through. But COVID brought up a lot of issues, right? And even today, th this kind of sounds scary because people blew the comments on the top left off when this person said it. But wow, th this could cause some problems going forward. And you saw on the top right-hand side, there's still a lot of debate about climate and what are we going to do? How are we going to manage that risk? And the big questions that people are starting to ask because they fill all this. So ma imagine you're a leader of a major global nonprofit or a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or an IBM or a Microsoft. The big questions are showing up, showing up on the bottom where companies started to say, wow, I think we're living in an age of the unknowns unknowns, meaning we really don't know what's going to happen next. And a lot of companies are starting to translate that into specific questions on the right-hand side that you can see into this, well, what, what are we missing? And, and so when I suggest to you that we have more risk management professionals that in New York City than we have police officers, I think you're beginning to get a sense of why that is. And here's what I want to lay a groundwork just to give you a sense of how this plays out around the world. Around the world, in most major economies, and I've traveled a lot, around the world, in most major economies, managing your risk in this crazy, uncertain world that we're in is really expected leadership behavior. And in many countries, happy to show you this if you come and, and take one of my classes, it's not only expected leadership behavior, but it's also the law. So some countries view all of this and react by saying we're going to we're going to write laws that says you must manage your risk. So so it's kind of become a expected core competency and a legal requirement in many organizations. The most important thing for you and I at least what excites me is it actually leads to greater value. One of the things we like to do as academics is create research papers and I can mathematically show you that if you manage your risk, you're going to create more value in the long run. Well, how does this play out in a nonprofit or a corporate world? Or I've recently worked with the World Bank, recently worked with the UN, um, with IBM, others. W what it means is within the company, you're looking at a risk map. Everybody wants to identify what their biggest risks are. And you can see here, people like to map their risk on impact and probability. You can see this on the, uh, on the two scales there. And in the upper right-hand side, everyone wants to know. Think about it in your own life. Don't you want to know what the biggest risk to you are instead of just 
whatever social media tells you, have you ever stopped and thought about, well, who am I as an individual? What all, what are my goals and what really are my biggest stress? And this is what organizations around the world are learning how to do. And they're trying to get really good at it because the better you can understand your uncertainty and your risk, the, the way more likely it is to achieve your objectives and create value if you're the World Bank, if you're the UN, or, or if you're Google as well. So, so everyone wants to know their top risk. The second big question is not only what are my biggest risks, but uh, are they of a certain nature? So for example, normally in a nonprofit or a for-profit organization, they, they put risk into buckets. Some would say, well, there's, there's risk around running the operations of the business. There's risk around finance. You can see these on the slide up at the top. There's risk around strategy. There's external risk. And, and what we've learned, and if you come to my, my favorite class, my strategic risk class, what we've learned is the most important risk when we look at the math and try and figure it out, it's usually the interesting one to me. It's something around strategy. And you can see I have that underlined in this middle slide. And this is some analysis that we actually do in class. I actually teach you how to do this analysis in class. I sent this to the chief risk officer of a big tech company. And he sent me what you're looking at. The chief risk officer of a major tech company sent back to me and said, wow, professor, look at this. So I just made the argument that strategy is the biggest risk. But I want to diverge just a moment. I was recently watching on Amazon Prime. Some of you probably have that instead of Netflix. That show, the, the new Lord of the Rings, the Power of the Rings. I can't remember exactly what they call it. It's actually pretty good. I was skeptical, but it's pretty good. But in the original Lord of the Rings, they have this moment where they meet at the elf castle. I can't remember what it's called. But this is the fundamentals of strategy. Uh, so so um, the three fundamentals of strategy are you got to set strategy. Then you've got to align, get the organization on board and have the business model. And then you got to deliver, right? So set strategy, build the business model and get alignment and then deliver, uh, um, actually go do what you said you were going to do. In the Lord of the Rings, that comes up by this example where they're at the Elf Castle and they decide we've got to destroy the ring. That's setting strategy, destroy the ring. And then the dwarf says something like, uh, you have my axe. And the elf says, you have my bow. And I don't remember what Gandalf says, but you, you now see alignment. So set the strategy, destroy the ring, alignment, everyone's on board. And then it takes them three more movies to actually actually destroy that ring. Here's how that, pl here's how that plays out if you're trying to run an organization, whether, again, it's the World Bank or, or Google or even a small organization. Uh, I just said that strategy was the biggest risk, but what this analysis shows right in front of you is it's usually setting strategy that is the biggest risk. In other words, corporations are reasonably good at once they know their strategy and they know how to, de to deliver, pardon me, on their business, business model and their plan. They're pretty good at doing it. Doesn't mean some bumps don't occur along the way. But the biggest risk, not only is it strategy, but it's the vision. Where are we going to um, succeed as an organization? Which markets, which products? What's our vision of the future? And this is, you can, I hope you're getting a sense of why I love not only risk, but the concept of strategic risk, because it's really fun stuff to have great arguments in the classroom about it. And this slide just kind of captures wh uh, where companies are getting in trouble uh, and it's strategic risk and specifically the setting the vision of the organization. Here's the good news and the bad news. Here's why you should all maybe want to be a leader someday. Um, I, I run an ERM center of excellence. It's kind of like an academic think tank. It's not political. One of those ones you might read about in the news. Ours is all about thought leadership around managing risk. A little bit about the conversation I'm having with those that have, that have joined in today. And so I've asked a large group of chief risk officers, said, okay, in your organization, is your leader good at setting strategy or executing on the strategy? So are, are they good about deciding where to succeed and what to do? Or are they good at 
actually delivering on it once they say it. And, and look at this number. I just left the one number on there, the 19% in the, in the upper right-hand side. Think about what that means for just a moment, 19%. So, so what does that mean? 19% of organizations say that, oh, well, well this is kind of scary, isn't it? Only 19%, I should say, only 19% of organizations say that their leader is good at both setting the strategy and then delivering or executing on the strategy. So what would be a good example of this? Okay, so in the early days, Elon Musk, and maybe even still today, whether we like him or not, he's really good at setting strategy, this big vision, and where are we going to go? What are we going to do? And hyperlink and all that. And the guy's amazing for that. That's really a skill set. But in the early days, specifically, some would say even today, he wasn't so good at making the cars. He had a lot of trouble getting those things out the door. I'll switch to Apple. I don't think Apple's had a great vision since Steve Jobs passed away at an early age, I might add. I think Tim Cook is great at delivering and executing, but not so much about the vision. And so you can see why I love this class and why this is considered core competence for leaderships and board members and, and people in at all levels of management because these are really questions about being successful or not. There's some data to reinforce what I'm suggesting to you. 70% of strategic plans fail, according to the ACCA, one of the largest finance organizations in the world. The big one up there, why, is, why does that happen? Because they underestimate the risk or they're biased on the top left-hand side. Or they're overconfident. I've been overconfident maybe once or twice in my life. So a lot of these plans fail. And when I ask my sort of a chief risk officer audience, how confident are you? You can see from the blue line, very few actually are confident. Which is why we've developed a one specific class that we call strategic risk analysis. And I'm going to share with you a little bit about some of the tools that we walk through I mean, granted, it's a it's a 14 week class. I've only got a few moments, but I'm just going to share with you some of the tools. But just to show you, this isn't just me. This is what the people that advise board members around the world. This is the pressure on them. So I've tried to sort of explain to you today that I believe the world is uncertain. I believe we're not only living in a digital age, which is opportunity, it really is, but we're living in a crazy world and people are starting to ask the big questions. And it should not surprise you then if we sort of connect the dots here, that people at the board level who are supposed to be overseeing these organizations, they're getting pressure. And you can see the sources if you want to read some of these. I think one of these is from Europe. The others are primarily from the NACD, which is a, a global organization that advises board members. But look what they're telling. I mean, this is really people that are on Warren Buffett's board as well. They're telling board members, look, if you're on the board of an organization, you need to question that old business model. Is that business model still going to be successful in the, in the future? On, on, on the lower left, the next bullet point. Hey, if you're on the board, you need to go to Microsoft or Apple or Tesla and say, are, are we vulnerable to some of these disruptive risks? Great question, great conversation to have. And on the top right-hand side, what are some of these exogenous external risks and how do we know what they are? A lot of organizations have built separate processes just to answer that exogenous risk question. And really, the trigger risk is an incredibly complicated one. A lot of opportunity for some smart people to figure that out and get rich. Please buy me dinner if you figure that out and get rich after I gave you the idea. But figuring out what are the trigger risks, the ones that are going to lead us down this road that we need to really be watching, because it's, it's very easy to miss some of the risks that are smaller, but are really the ones that are going to cause the whole thing to either be great or to fail. McKinsey wrote a nice article a couple of years ago that said, okay, look, let's just summarize it. What should we do when there's so much risk and uncertainty? We need to gather. We need to get together more often to discuss risk. We need the right people in the room, people that understand strategy, people that understand business, people that understand risk. And, and then we need to have the conversation, right? We, I've heard, heard so many people tell me that one of the biggest benefits of risk management and enterprise risk management 
isn't necessarily that we we got an actuary to do some analysis, but it's that we started to have a really important conversation. We started to talk about things that we have never talked about before. But I need to challenge you just a little bit if you can think about this. So some of your I hopefully are excited about what, what I've been sharing and what I'm passionate about. But when I say risk, again, I don't mean just insurance or just hazard. Yes, it is certainly those things that are out there. But one of the things that we cover in our class is, well, well what is risk? Well, it, it is about how probable things are. Well, will that risk happen? Will will there be another global coronavirus or virus? I, Probably will, right? How likely is it? It's about what's the downside. It's about agility. Does my organization have the ability to pivot and turn when these uncertain things come up? I've written an, an entire research paper on that concept of agility. It is on the bottom left about having a portfolio, a portfolio of risk, a portfolio of business models, a portfolio of skill sets. It, it is about understanding the so-called black swan, which means the risk that you can't see, but it's really big and you just missed it. It, it is about velocity, about well, how quick is that? Is that risk moving? There is this economic theory concept of utility. I'm going to translate it to risk appetite and tolerance. It is about what you what you care about and how much risk do you want to take when you're pursuing certain objectives? Pardon me. It is about other things like resiliency and, and volatility and FOMO on the bottom right, pardon me, uh, and the fear, the fear of missing out. So when we get into these classes, we get deep into the intellectual side and have a little bit fun with, do we really know what risk is? And here's the weird part. I don't know if you know this or not. You actually have a part of your brain that's kind of wired for risk. I, I don't do this type of research on brains. I'm not a neurosurgeon, but you should know that when they put you in these experiments and have you make a risky decision, this is, this is kind of weird, isn't it? A part of your brain actually lights up. I don't know if it's a a God thing or an evolution thing. I'll let you make your own decisions about that. I'm certainly not a theologian or an evolutionist, uh, but it's fascinating to me that you are hardwired in some way to deal with risk. There is something in you. We've just got to figure out how to capture it because we want your organization to be more successful in the long run. So all this leads to what I'm going to say on this next slide. So Amber's going to talk about you know, we our overall portfolio of what we do at St. John's University. But what I want to sp focus on for just a moment is uh, I specifically lead the enterprise risk management degree, and I have a think tank on this as well. And just look at the numbers for in 2011. If you some of you might do this now and put it in the chat room, I'm curious if you searched on the phrase enterprise risk management in 2011, yeah, you get eight million hits. 2013, 54. Two years later, 1572, 2020. I mean, look at this. We're, we're getting close to 600, 700, 800. We're getting close to a billion hits. So this is not just me making this up. This concept of enterprise risk management is really becoming a big deal around the world. And if you want to be an academic, just to let you know, I abbreviated enterprise risk management on the left-hand side with the, with the ERM right there. Even in actual academic research, you can see that enterprise risk management versus accounting and marketing, it was behind. And now recently, ERM is caught up. So academics are trying to study this. Why? Because it's the latest, coolest thing. It's something we haven't thought about before, right? We've had the Black Shows model and some other stuff and Keynes theory. and all. We've had all that for a while, but there hasn't been anything as new in the business world since this phrase right now. And, and on the right-hand side, this concept of enterprise risk and value recently won one of the best papers uh, It withstood the test of time. So it's a great topic. Uh, you can see right here, it's happening a lot. It's becoming, to, uh, it's a topic that's getting researched more and more. And, and there is a right way to do it. So there are, this is a framework. This is an enterprise risk management. You can see it right in the middle. This is an enterprise risk management framework. So there is a right way 
to, to do it. And, and so each uh, country or uh, stock exchange will adopt their way of doing it. This is one of the most dominant ones. This is called the COSO Enterprise Risk Management Framework. The ISO organization has one. I recently helped the country of India write their own framework. So th th this is really just someone trying to capture, well, how would we, how would we do or practice enterprise risk management? Now, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, and I just want to highlight on the left-hand side, we have a uh, master's in business and MBA with a concentration in enterprise risk management. You can take classes from me. I, uh, I love teaching, as you can probably tell. We also have a master's of science in enterprise risk management. And if you're bored, go click on those on the web page. Maybe not now, maybe later. That's fine. Uh, and I also have a center for excellence in enterprise risk management. And all those things go together because the center keeps me relevant in the classroom. So, for example, on the center, once a semester, doing this again in two weeks, I'll bring in about 90 chief risk officers mostly North America, but also from around the world. And we'll just spend a day going deep on some of these topics. How do we get better at strategic risk? How do we build an exogenous emerging risk uh, ability? How do we do that? How do we tie that in, into the organization? So these are things that I do that I love to do. I think they make the classroom better. They give us the ability to network and stay in touch with executives and hear what they're working on as well. And I'm going to spend just a couple minutes before I turn it over to Amber to give you a sense of what I do in this one strategic risk analysis class. You can see right in front of you, this is sort of my theory of how I think about strategic risk analysis. You, you, you really have to set the, the vision for the organization. You've got to come up with what is our business model? How are we going to create value? What's the capabilities uh, we need? You've got to decide, are we going to play in that field? Or are we looking for the blue oceans? I'll go over that book in just a moment. We've got to align the organizations. We've got to constantly think about disruptions, trends, meta risk. We, we've got to pivot. We've got to be agile when that comes up. And, and so really what I love about this class is it gets down to the heart and soul of the organization. So I try and teach the students in this class that you've got to really understand the heart and soul of any organization. What really is it that makes that organization tick and makes them successful and makes them pursue with passion what they do? And it's it's an incredibly uh, difficult question, but you really don't know the big risk until you know that. You just think about your own life or your friends. What, what are you really about or what is your friend or someone you care about? What really is it that drives them? Well, until you know that, you don't know the real risk. You could come up with a set, but you really got to dig. And so what we teach students is a variety of tools. I'll show you the tool set in just a moment. There are many ways to dig into an organization, again, whether it's not for profit or for profit, and figure out uh, what is the most important thing to that organization. So, for example, one thing we do is a business model risk analysis, where we try and develop this deep knowledge of the business and the business model, uh, including both the heart and soul. What, why do we do it? To track the risk, to see the new risk, to define what really is the most important risk, to really see potential new business model opportunities as well, to identify disruptive risk and, and develop some key performance or key risk indicators, if you don't know what those are. Those are actually really, <clears throat> excuse me, really valuable as well. Uh, students in my class, this is when they were analyzing Facebook, they'll develop a product portfolio. Where are all the products of Facebook at a point in time? And are they in the emerging phase, the growth phase, the mature phase? It's really insightful to understand your products and where they are. You, you really got to do this to get the big picture on risk. And, and, and then if you, if you don't remember anything today, go read this book. This book mathematically, please don't tell the professors who wrote this, I said this, but I strongly believe it. Mathematically, this book stinks, but it doesn't matter. What this book does is it encourages us to think about blue oceans. The blue oceans, as you can see, is the uncontested markets. Our leaders, CEOs, thinking about the, the next place they could win, the next product, the next marketplace. And so this book is great 
because it really encourages us to have this vision of where should you be going as an organization? I, I love this book, uh, and that's just why we use it in the classroom. We also, in my strategic risk analysis class, cover how to develop a value proposition. So, okay, so I, I know where I'm going to compete now, at least I think I do, but what's the value? And do, do I understand that? Really important to understand the value proposition. And we use that book to try and flush it out. Amber, I don't even know if this was your class or not, but we we, we also in class, this is the most fun we ever had, by the way. My students tell me that was so much fun. We try and develop new business models. And on the right hand, you can side, we have this massive brainstorming, uh, almost competition-like thing in class where we come up with all these new business ideas I'm going to brag for just a moment. A couple of the ideas my students have come up with have been way ahead of before the company even thought of them. So I'm proud of what our students do when they get in this environment and apply some of these tools. You can see all those stickies are new businesses that my students thought of. You can see why I like this. Going back to the very beginning, because the world is so uncertain and there's so many crazy things historically and even today, we're always looking externally. So so, so you can see in front of you, there's kind of like this rectangle with all these little stickies. That's really kind of the business model of the movie theater experience. So people go to movies because they want to they want to hear a story and the and the customer segment is the movie goers. But, but wait a minute, there's a lot of things happening out there. People are watching things more and more, not in the movie theater, but on their phone or on some other device. There's going to be bandwidth issues that might change all this. <laughs> Maybe driving this car will lead us if we ever get that. We're going to watch in our car. Then there's pandemics, post-pandemics, or people going back to the theater, or are they, I, I don't know. Then there's a competition from all the people that develop movies. And so what we try and teach is you can think about the business model but it's really silly if you're not also thinking what is happening outside and external. And, and you can see, this is a quote from one very successful board member that I met. And just kind of look at what she said to me for just a moment when I asked her about the concept of managing risk in large organizations. And she says, what, what, uh, you can see it here. I'm going to move this on my screen so I can see the whole thing. Give me just one second here. You can see where she says, well, look, Professor, I can remember saying that, but I didn't put the professor there. The risk that kills most companies and why companies don't last long anymore, I'm embellishing just a little bit, why they only last 20 years, 40% and 60% are gone after 40 years. The risk is what? It's business risk. It's why we have this degree. It's why we have so many risk professionals now that we didn't have a few years ago. And, and I'll go on. You need to understand your market. You didn't have the right talent. There's only a few things that can go wrong, right? You're asleep and the market changed. You didn't have the right people. You weren't challenging uh, the people to anticipate around the corner. You weren't bringing in that objective info. And I'll just skip to the end. It's very simple. It's just hard. So it's simple, but it's hard. And this is what we're trying to get at in these classes is the train you, the ability to, to it, it is hard. So we got to train you on how you're going to, how you're going to do that. Sorry, I clicked on the wrong button there. And now what's the latest, greatest? So it's a never ending because even after all the stuff going on in the world, we've got a new risk. We've got Gen AI. Just look at some of the headlines. Amazon CEO says Gen, a Gen AI could be the largest technological transfer transformation since the internet. Seriously, that's, that's big. I mean, if the guy's right, that's, that's really unbelievable. Maybe we should all go buy those stocks of those companies that invested in this. Out of Japan, it could cause social collapse. Uh-oh. So it's big, but it could be horrible. I And I added the McKinsey one because I like this one. Hey, it can be value. So it's a risk. It's a new disruption, but there's value there. We've got to learn to capture that value, which again is why I love our class because that's what we're trying to do. So one of the things I did recently at one of my summits with my chief risk officers was we spent all day arguing about Gen AI. And I'm just going to share with you a few of the things that we talked about. Notice first that a lot of corporations, the questions were, our competitors are ahead of us in downside and upside. And just look at the amount of orange and, and red. Most people feel like they're behind opportunity for you and I to teach, to do research, to get jobs, to get ahead on this subject. So most organizations feel behind 
on Gen AI. Most organizations feel like, oh, we got to work on the capabilities. Remember what I just taught about 15 minutes ago, the three pieces, three elements of strategy, set the vision and then develop the capabilities in the business model. That's what this one's about. And so on the Gen AI topic, 47% say, God, we, uh, we've got the vision. That's 53% that don't. Some corporations still haven't figured out what are we going to do with Gen AI, with Gen AI, excuse me. 42% either bought or built. So they recognize I got to get the skill set. So uh, less than half are going after the skill set. Only 27% are, are, are actually change the talent and the culture. Not going to happen unless you change the organization internally. Only 24% have integrated it. 45% have adopted a framework. So, so we're trying to put some guides, almost a moral code, some boundaries around AI to make sure we, we give it some guidance and we don't. We don't do more harm than value that we're creating. This is just a, a word cloud. When we ask corporations, well, what do you think boards are concerned about? You can see they're concerned about the risk. They are concerned about privacy and cyber downside, reputational side, and the middle misuse. They're concerned about the deep impact, but they're also concerned about the upside. What is the upside? We got to figure that out, which is why I like this 705 class. I finally asked them, well, what's the key to managing the upside? Because I love the upside. That's how we're going to create value, as McKinsey was suggesting on the slide a couple of weeks ago. 21% say, look, the key is going to be figure out the risk in the business cases and the business model as early as possible. So as we go down this gen AI road and try to be great or find this blue ocean, what's the risk? We need to see that and identify it early so we can manage it early. In this 705 class, just to wrap it up, we go over a lot of tools. And this is just a variety of the tools. It's why I like this class. We try and make you dangerous, if I could say it that way. We try to teach you a lot of different tools on things that you can do in this particular area. And, and when I teach this class, I always think about it this way. There are a lot of books like Blue Ocean and others, Good to Great, Innovator's Dilemma book by Clayton Christensen. There, there's a lot of theories about how to succeed. Uh, people, people love those books. How am I going to be a great company? How am I going to make more money? How am I going to meet my mission? A lot of books that do that. Those books sell really well. There's a lot of books that are theories of failure. Don't run out of cash. <laughs> Drucker's Theory of the Business. Clayton Christensen's Watch Out for Those Innovations. They're going to put you out of business. But I like to think of it, if the world is really as uncertain as I've argued it is in these 30 minutes I've been talking, 30-something minutes, really maybe the biggest one is failing to identify and manage the risk. We just absolutely have got to get better at that. And I'm going to stop sharing because that is the end of my slideshow. Uh, I hope you've noticed that as a professor, I can talk forever. I've tried to keep it focused and hopefully find something exciting for you. And was it too boring? Um, it probably is kind of obvious that I love this subject. So I'm going to let Amber talk for just a few moments. I'll shut you up, You can Amber. never be boring if you try, Dr. Walker. And yes, okay, that was our well, class. And that was one yeah. of the uh, most fun classes that we had. Although, um, as I always say, your programs and your classes were the most fun in the degree. We had a lot of fun and learned a lot. And I can say that even as someone in higher education, which is not a degree that I think most people would think of when they think of enterprise risk management, I am constantly um, bothering my boss with ideas and problems and um, coming up with issues that really don't necessarily involve me or peripherally involve me. And um, she often says to me, Amber, you get one problem that isn't related to admissions to bring to me each week <laughs> because there's so many different things that I notice um, with my ERM degree. So I am just very quickly going to chat a little bit about some of the degree offerings at St. John's. Um, as promised, I will be um, very quick, uh, but this is, um, as Dr. Walker had mentioned, um, one of our few degrees within the Graduate School of Business at Tobin College of Business at St. John's University. Um, we have very small class sizes on the graduate side. Um, generally, we're about 17 to 1, and our largest classroom holds about 25 students. When I was in the MS ERM, some of the beginner classes had 20 to 25 students. And then as we got down to the core classes, 
Some of them were as small as seven to 10 students. So you really get to know your fellow classmates, you get to know your professors. We have an alumni um, event next week that I'm really excited to see some of my um, fellow classmates and friends at. So um, it is a very close knit organization. Um, lots of other points you can read here, but as Dr. Walker mentioned, our curriculum is endorsed by a lot of professional organizations. Our online masters are ranked number 38 by US News. And we are one of only six universities in New York that is doubly accredited in um, business and accounting, which is uh, by AACSB, which is the best business accreditation in the United States. Um, so within the School of Risk Management, um, we are recognized as a global leader of education. Um, and you can see some of the other professional designations that are listed on the screen. Um, and then on the left, that's actually a picture of our campus down in Manhattan where the MSERM, as well as the School of Risk Management is based. Um, so we have campuses, oh, sorry, campuses in both Queens, uh, Manhattan, and, and then obviously online options. So as international students, you're able to participate in classes on either New York campuses or online um, if you'd like to be completely online and we also have the flexibility to offer you to come to campus for say one semester so if you wanted to come in the fall and take three or four classes in person meet your classmates and then return home and finish your degree online that's an option as well and um, all of the programs are very flexible um, so in terms of the application requirements um, we do require actually the online um, application of course one letter of recommendation from either a professional or an academic source, your resume, a statement of professional goals, which only has to be about 350 words explaining why you're interested in the degree that you're applying to, um, why you're interested in St. John's in general, and how you hope that that degree can help you um, in your future career. We are GMAT and GRE optional, so we do not require those exams, but if you have a high score, so um, higher 600 or higher on the GMAT or 315 or higher on the GRE, it can help with scholarships. Um, and then we need transcripts from all of your institutions you've attended after high school. So um, if you have international credits, we do require a course by course foreign credit evaluation with GPA calculation from a NACES member. Um, I do have a list of all of the institutions that we accept evaluations from along with their costs. So I can send my email in the chat if you'd like to reach out to me for that. And then we do require the TOEFL, IELTS, or Duolingo, or PTE exam. Um, so this is just a list of all of our MBA concentrations. Um, we just actually got approval to add an additional concentration in AI, artificial intelligence. So that brings us up to 18 different concentrations. Um, and as Dr. Walker mentioned, enterprise risk management is one of those 18 concentrations. Um, we also have a STEM MBA. So students are able to pick from two of the concentrations here, which Again, just to prove is that ERM is one of the now seven concentrations within the STEM MBA program. So you can um, take the core curriculum, which is nine courses, um, and then pick two concentrations and uh, graduate with the MBA that is STEM designated to extend your CPT or OPT. And then finally, we have our MS programs, which are listed here. Um, there's a few symbols following them, um, but all of the programs are available exclusively online with the exception of finance um, at Risk and Financial Advisory. Um, and then for the ERM and um, Risk Management, Risk Analytics and Actual Science programs, you're automatically considered for academic scholarships ranging anywhere from $5,000 to full tuition. Um, the ERM and Risk Management programs also have um, other scholarships you can apply to, which is the Alati Fellowship, which is a full tuition fellowship um, for those who are already in the industry or have had some internship experience in the industry or a good handle on uh, what they're hoping to do with their ERM degree. And then we also have a fellowship for students who are involved in DEI um, through Zurich. We also have some advanced certificate options, which aren't as popular with international students, but I can always speak to you about those. You can think of them kind of as a half of the degree option. Um, and then I just want to quickly go forward. We have career advisors on campus who can help you with building your resume, interview prep, um, securing internships and career placement shadow days with our alum um, or other people in the industry. We have global destination courses, which I participated in um, a global reinsurance course where we met with 85% of the reinsurance companies in the world, which was incredible. Um, and then as you can see on the right-hand side, lots of different scholarships, but I think the good thing to take away is that um, everybody accepted to an MS program is automatically considered for merit awards, which 
um, can get pretty generous, especially if you're applying to GSRM. Right, and this is our contact information listed here. You can see Downey Thunderbird uh, dancing at the bottom waiting for your application. Um, but I think I made it in time. Yep, one minute to spare. So uh, I'll turn it back over to Carolina for any questions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation and for the int really interesting debate. Um, I see that we already have some questions from the participants. So uh, let's start with the first one. Uh, okay, the first one is, thank you so much. Uh, so far, the presentation talks about natural uncertain risk. What about that uh, caused by the government um, deliberately to just frustrate a business or caused by lack of technical knowledge? How do the executives go about salvaging su such? Okay, Carolina, could you repeat kind of right in the middle? What about the code? Is What was the question? Yeah, I think is um about the uh, the government that uh just frustrate a business or caused by a lack of technical knowledge. How do the executives go about saving such? Um, okay, I'm not sure, sure I'm going to answer the question because <laughs> I'm not so sure I understand it. But I think um my my first thought or my first response was regulation is a big risk. There's no question that as an organization, you have to think about that. So for example, we recently, Amber didn't, or maybe Amber mentioned this and I dozed off, but um, we have a travel class a, a, that we take students to Europe. And this year we took them to, to Bermuda. If you come to our program, you can apply for that. It's, it's almost completely funded. It's kind of like a free trip. But we met some CEOs in Bermuda and said, what, why are you here? Why did you launch a company out of Bermuda? Speed to market, less regulation. So, uh, how a government regulates a business is a very big deal and alters behavior about where entrepreneurs will create wealth and launch new companies. Even in older companies that are established, regulation is a big risk that you've got to think about because whether you believe in certain things or not, if the government passes a law, it's now your risk. You got to you got to be ready to respond to that. So I don't know. I'm ho hopefully I'm answering the question. Uh, we, we do discuss that. It is a big deal. But there's also the concept around uh, government. So um, some one or two countries in the world develop and apply enterprise risk management to their government. In the U.S., uh, we, we have a requirement that the U.S. federal agency, so each piece of the government, they are legally required to do enterprise risk management. So government has to apply it to themselves as well. I've written about that if you want to know more. Okay, thank you. You're and uh, the next one is if they can have the presentation. Um, I don't know if you maybe want to share it in the email that we will send to the students tomorrow with the registration okay. of the webinar and the presentation as well. Okay. Okay. So, great. Carolina, I'll, I'll leave it up to you to contact me. and, and Yeah, exactly. You can send it to me so okay. we can share the presentation with the students. Um, okay, so the next one is this method of reducing costs can serve a growing economy. Oh, there's no question. <laughs> Please email me if you want to discuss that. Uh, I've been trying to get several friends of mine that have way more power than I do to write about managing risk to the U.S. economy. I strongly believe in that as a concept. Um, and in fact, in this other article I've written, I've argued that my government should be doing that. And we're not. We, I don't know if you make fun of your government like we do in the U.S. We, we all make fun of our own governments, right? So, But I want my government to manage the economy better. And they should be doing that. And they're not. And I've got a solution. I've written an article on that as well. Amber, I haven't, I haven't sent that one to you, but I, I have one if you're, if you're interested. You know, I'll always read it. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. And in your experience, what are some common challenges companies face when attempting to implement a comprehensive risk management framework, and how can these challenges be overcome? Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So so the biggest one, uh, and I, I actually have an answer for this that we cover in class. I'm not going to get all of it. I only got a little bit of time anyway, is always getting buy-in from leadership. So so there's, there's a cultural issue of getting buy-in. So uh, let me just tell you a short side story. I, I went to, I'm not going to mention the company. I went, walked into the boardroom 
I'm not making this stuff up that I'm telling you today, uh, with a 40-year-old tech billionaire. Why? His board wanted me to come talk to him because he really controlled the company, 40-year-old tech billionaire. Um, and, and they wanted me to talk about literally what I just talked to, uh, to you about. He wasn't happy. Why? Because his view was, I launched this company. I created this. Why would the board? Well, why would the board? Because number one, there are laws. Number two, most of us intellectually get it that, duh, you should be thinking about risk and uncertainty. But someone that launches a company from scratch, right out of college, I'd be, Amber, you and I'd be a little cocky if we, we'd be very confident that we've got the world under control. But you don't. You, no one controls the. Maybe somebody controls the world. Whoever does, I don't, I, I don't know them that well. If there is someone, maybe I've met them. But so, so buy-in is a big one. And then you got to build the system, right? You got to support it. How are we going to do this? Well, you, you got to build a way to do it. And that's what we talk about in class. So a, a buy-in and culture are some of the big ones up front. And I have more, but don't have time for all of them. <laughs> Thank you. And how does the process of identifying risks differ when applied to various departments within an organization? And what strategies are effective in ensuring comprehensive coverage across the entire company? Wow, these are sophisticated questions. So how does risk vary by department? And what was the second part of that? Uh, what strategies are effective in ensuring comprehensive coverage across the entire company? Okay, so... so um, there's a couple of ways to think of this. Some people very much believe in a top-down approach to, to doing this. Others believe in a bottom-up. So a bottom-up would be each department does this. So, so department A does it, department B does it, department C does it. So, so that's how you would make sure every department does it. And that's the first part of that question. And it's also how you would make sure it's comprehensive. So if, if I make each department do it, I know a few, less than a dozen that actually have put managing risk as part of someone's uh, pay and bonus plan. So if you don't manage your risk, um, then you don't get a raise this next year or you don't get your bonus. That will get people's attention. So, so top down, bottom up, but think about it. There, there's probability and velocity. Those are scientific mathematical answers. How likely is something? How fast is it moving? Anytime I introduce a human being into it, now I'm getting preferences and I'm getting biases. Daniel Kahneman just passed away, won a Nobel Prize for pointing out to the whole econ and finance world that human beings are biased. We just are. So, so you've got to constantly battle, how do I know I've got the right set of risk? That's always a challenge. Thank you. And... Um... Uh, a more practical uh, question is about uh, if you require a minimal level of English to access to the course. So we do. Um, it depends on the score will depend on which exam students take. So whether that's the TOEFL, IELTS, Duolingo, or PTE, um, but that's part of the application process. So if a student um, does not meet our minimum English requirements, they can actually enroll in our English Language Institute to get their. English language up to what we're looking for to ensure your success in graduate studies. Um, or students also have the opportunity, depending on their score, to take English language ESL courses in conjunction with their business courses if needed. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, can you elaborate on the methods for assessing and prioritizing risks, especially when faced with a multitude of potential threats? the organization's operations and objectives. Yeah, I'm just writing this. Okay. Um, let me go back to the first part. <laughs> yeah, of course. I can read it again Very for you. No first, worries. before you assess and prioritize, you have to know what they are. So, so you, you got to have a good effort on what do I think the risks are. And you would want to have done a comprehensive, to go back to the earlier question, once I know what they are, then there's a separate method for assessing and then prioritizing, right? So some people take a subjective qualitative approach to doing that. I'm not a fit. I'm a empirical quantitative person. I'm not offended by the subjective qualitative approach. Sometimes it's spot on, it's accurate, and it's valid, and we should just do it. I prefer getting data to uh, support or supplement. I prefer building models 
we don't make you do this in the class, but there are opportunities to do this. So, so some people love them. We need to model every risk. Some people love the subjective qualitative approach. We teach all those approaches. So, so the assessing and prioritization is get the right set of risks and then apply the right tool. What's the tool you need? Is it heavy quants? Is it, um, is it going to be a Monte Carlo simulation? Is it going to be some sort of actuarial? I, I don't know. Each organization gets to make that call on their own. There is guidance on that if you want to know more from the ISO. There's, they have an entire document on risk assessment and picking the right tool. And the second part of that question was, oh, especially with multiple. So, so the multiple thing gets into the portfolio way beyond the scope of what I can tell today. If you solve this one, you'll be as rich as Elon Musk. No one's figured out how to correlate uncorrelated risk. How do I correlate strategic, regulatory, and reputation with foreign currency or operation supply chain risk? I know a few people that are trying to solve that one. If you solve it, you're going to be very wealthy. Please show me dinner if you do that one. Great. Thank you. And how does the effective risk management contribute to the overall resilience and sustainability of a company, particularly in volatile and uncertain environments? Who, whoever asked that question, please apply to this degree. I need you in the classroom. <laughs> this, in the last three years coming out of COVID, corporations around the world, especially in the UK and the US, for maybe obvious reasons, maybe not, are rethinking the risk and resilience connection because COVID kind of caught us off guard of, oh, I'm not as resilient as I thought I was. Oh my gosh. McKinsey and PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, have written some good guidance about there are seven dimensions of resilience. Uh, what's a couple? Financial resilience. Do I have money to survive this? Uh, we all want that one. Reputational resilience. Can my reputation withstand this risk? Strategic business model resilience. So uh, in the UK, they had a couple big um, embarrassing corporate blowups. They're, they're considering a law linking resilience and risk and making you say to your stakeholders, top 10 risk, uh, am I resilient or not? I actually think the US should follow. I'm not in charge of the US government, but if I were, I would, do, I would follow that approach in the US. That's a great question. And people in the US that I, that I work with are trying to figure out the answer to that question. Wonderful question. Thank you so much. And are there any specific academic or professional backgrounds that the university values in applicants? Amber, you wanna try that one? Sure, uh, and the answer, especially for this degree is is no. Um, you know, ERM, as I'm sure everyone's learned from this webinar is appropriate and applicable to every single industry um, and every single person. And so um, we've had students come in and be successful from every different type of major, um, particularly for ERM. There are some programs at the university that require prerequisite um, majors or certain courses in undergrad, but ERM isn't one of them. Um, the only one within the business school would be the actual science program. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, the next question is, what are the best run to risk management strategies? The best run are you in? Yeah, I think it's uh, maybe um, the best action. And I, I know what um, the student, if you want to to repeat your question, maybe explain yeah. us better <laughs> what's yeah, your uh, meaning. Uh, yeah, I'll just answer generically. Yeah, Most thank you. organizations and boards are saying, okay, I, let's assume we identified the right risk. What are we doing about them? And companies are developing and getting more sophisticated. Uh, well, what are the actions I'm going to take to manage that risk? I'll give you a, one brief example. I had General Mills present, uh, some of you may know them, global organization, uh, recently about their supply chain and third-party risk, a more traditional risk, but they're really aggressive with a lot of actions about understanding their supply chain risk globally uh, and then understanding all the third parties they deal with and what are the cyber risks, what are the business continuity risk of the third party, what are the reputational risk of the third party. So they get really into aggressively managing those risks. Yeah, okay. The student um, just write uh, the best risk strategies. 
It, that's going to depend on the risk. First, you want to see it, assess it, put it in a portfolio, link it back to your strategy and your goals, uh, and then decide how to manage it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, another one is how can organizations balance the need for innovation and growth with the imperative of robust risk management practices in today's complex and interconnected business environment? Yes, yeah, so I've written a couple papers on innovation and risk. You have to identify the risk and in innovation. You want to be you want to innovate more, more successfully, understand the risk, understand the risk along the way. That's a great topic. And how can organizations integrate dynamic risk assessment metho methodologies, uh, leveraging advanced data analytics and scenario planning to anticipate and mitigate multifaceted risks, spanning cyber threats, supply chain disruptions, regulatory <laughs> changes, and so this, social political yeah. volatility in an interconnected world? Uh, yeah, it sounds like this, this person works at KPMG. So if you don't know, go, go search online later. KPMG is trying to develop the answer to that question. They have this dynamic, I'm going to emphasize that word, dynamic risk assessment tool, a great idea. Other consultants will probably try and copy them because people want to learn how to be more dynamic. If they send me an email, I, I've written a paper. Sounds like I write too much, but maybe I don't, according to some people. But anyway, um, I've written a paper on being more agile. Uh, the ability to be agile to respond to risk. I think that's more important today than, than it ever was. We, the world is moving crazily, as I said earlier. We've got to have the ability to pivot and change strategy and do it quickly. We can't can't be slow like we are in in uh, higher education. <laughs> Thank you. And I think we have the last question. Okay. Um, that is, does the course cover risk and resilience strategies that can be contextualized for African businesses and governments? Uh, yes, we don't. The, the way the material is taught, it's not for one particular organization. Just as an aside, I recently had, maybe I shouldn't say, a major nonprofit out of Ethiopia asked me to do training for them on almost exactly what I did for you today, but an eight hour, so an eight hour version of what I did for you today, um, a, a great organization out of Ethiopia. So th they would say, yes, they want the same training. So I'm gonna just go with them and say, if they think it applies, I think it applies. Okay, thank you so much. I think we, we answered all the questions and great. just perfectly in time. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much to the panelists for the really interesting presentation and also thank everyone for joining us and for your uh, questions. I'd like to remind everyone interested in receiving a certificate of attendance by Doxity that you can click in the link that I'm sending in the chat right now and request it. And before you, we say goodbye, uh, I would like to ask to Paul and uh, Amber if they want to leave our participants with a message, maybe. I'll just say, if you're interested, um, come join us. I can um, definitely echo that. And I'm also I'm sending my email in the chat. I don't have access to everybody, unfortunately. But Carolina, if you want to send it to the participants so they have it, if anybody has any questions. Feel free and reach out to me directly. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has. Thank you. I think it's really useful. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks again to our palace and to the students. And um, I hope to see you again in the next webinar organized by Doc City, of course. So goodbye, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks, thank everyone. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.